All right, guys, welcome to another video here at the, the Lone Trail. Today, I am answering your running questions in a Q&A video. So last week, I asked a bunch of you, I asked all of you guys to just post your questions regarding running in the comment section of my video. And I got tons of great questions and I'm gonna answer them today in this video. Uh, so stay tuned. All right, so I really love Q&A videos because they're just fun to make and they're fun to watch and it's just all fun. Uh, and if you, if you like Q&A videos, I just want to mention this before I answer the questions. I do actually make monthly Q&A videos over on my Patreon page. I'll put a link to it up there and you can go check it out. Patreon is basically a place where you pay like maybe $5 a month or even $3 a month and you get access to exclusive content on a regular basis. I post uh, unedited video snippets where I share things about my training, just my training life, my running, uh, and I do monthly Q&A videos as well where I answer your questions. So if you're interested in that, go check that out. Without further ado, let's get to the questions. All right, first question is from Eric. Do you think it would be easier for you to store energy before a run if your diet contained more protein and fat, especially saturated fat? Well, first of all, my diet does contain a fair amount of protein actually I do probably eat about 120 grams of protein a day something like that uh, from uh, my whole foods from fruits vegetables but also from uh, pea protein powder so I, I wouldn't really increase that uh, and also protein isn't really a main uh, macronutrient that's used for energy um, fat the thing with increasing fat is that you will also then decrease carbohydrate and carbohydrate is really important for endurance athletes so, and I do eat a fair amount of fat anyway, I, I probably do eat about 40 grams a day, which I think is, you know, on the, is more or less ideal, I think. So, and that's one thing. But the other thing is that in terms of storing energy before a run, even regardless of diet, your energy when you're running actually comes mostly from your uh, stores in your body. And even a skinny person like me still has like, between six and 10 kilos of fat on the body. And that's thousands and thousands of calories that you can draw upon when you're running. And it doesn't really matter if you eat fat or not. If you do eat a low carb diet, a high fat diet, then you do get better at burning fat, that's true. But you also run at a slower pace and you're not able to really perform as well as when you're eating carbohydrates. So for performance, it's not really ideal to do that. Um, on a regular basis anyway. Uh, and in terms of storing energy, in terms of carbohydrate, the more carbohydrate you eat, the easier you'll store glycogen, and glycogen is a key um, energy source when you're running to produce ATP, which gets you to move. So uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think uh, more protein or more fat would make me store more energy. I'm storing plenty already. Uh, saturated fat is something that I avoid for the most part. It's, it's linked with various um, heart and cardiovascular diseases. It's not really optimal, I think, to eat a lot of saturated fat, but there is a little bit of saturated fat in my diet, and I think that's a good thing, but not too much. Good question, though. Next question is from his, his star, yeah, I don't know. Histaral, his, Histarele. Hi Mikael, not sure if you've touched on this topic, but I have a horrible time sleeping, especially when I'm consistently running. My adrenaline skyrockets afterwards, I'm wired the entire night, sleep schedule starting to suffer. Any techniques uh, to avoid overtaxing adrenals when you're running? What's the optimal hours of sleep? I don't use stimulants. Good question. Well, first of all, I want to do a little plug and tell you about my sleep ebook. I actually have a book about sleep. I, I sell it over on my Sweet Natural Living page. I'll put a link to it there. Uh, oh, I don't know if I can put, put a link to it actually there because that's a different website. I'll put a link to it in the description. And so check that out. That's about optimizing your sleep. Now in terms of how running affects your sleep, yes, uh, your adrenaline will go up after you run. Uh, but it typically goes down at least adrenaline goes down fairly quickly, whereas noradrenaline stays in the system for longer. I might have gotten those mixed up, but at, at, at least one of them stays for longer. And it can affect your sleep, especially if you're running too late in the day. It's kind of like drinking coffee. I, don't, I know you don't do stimulants, which is a good idea, but if you do drink coffee, 
the typical recommendation is to avoid coffee, you know, after lunch or whatever, because it might affect your sleep. But, well, it's the same kind of thing with training. I, I think it's better to run earlier in the day rather than later. And so that might be the reason why you're struggling. Also, if you're running too much for what you're able to tolerate at any given point of time in your training, uh, you know, journey, that might affect you. Like if you're essentially overreaching a little bit, maybe training a little bit too hard, too much or whatever for your current fitness, that might tax you a bit too much and affect your sleep. Um, also, I want to mention that, you know, most of your running should be easy. So on hard workout days, sure, it might affect your sleep a little bit negatively. It does for me as well. But on most days, you should be running easy and that shouldn't really affect you too much. Um, also do a cool down. If you've done a hard workout, you should do a cool down. It sort of flushes the system a little bit, gets the adrenaline moving out, uh, etc. So do a cool down after a hard session. That might help you. In terms of hours, optimal amount, it, I talk about this in my book, um, Sweet Dreams. But uh, yeah, I would say enough. That's how much you need. You need enough. But typically for an athlete, that's like 9 to 10 hours at least, I would say. Even 11 hours for some high-level athletes. Um, all right, good question. Bill Baggins. Hey, I would like to know about stretching and weights. Do you incorporate much of that into your training for injury prevention? And do you think Kipchoge will break two hours later this year? Yeah, Kipchoge is trying to break two hours again in the Ineos 159 challenge. And I think he's going to do it. I think he's going to do it. And it doesn't matter if it, well, it matters if he does it or not. not but um, I'm a fan regardless. He's an epic athlete. I uh, love Kipchoge. So that's exciting. Stretching and weights, yes, I've, I do stretching and weights. I, I've, I do foam rolling, I do some uh, stretching, and, and but mostly stretching-wise, I'm actually working on my mobility because I don't have optimal range of motion. And I think that's where stretching comes in. If your range of motion isn't ideal, that could affect your running performance. And so I'm working on sort of getting to a point where I have optimal range of motion through stretching. And when I'm at that point, I'll just reduce my amount of stretching and sort of uh, make it a maintenance routine rather than somewhere, some something that I'm doing too often, right? Because too much stretching can actually be bad for your running performance. In terms of weights, I do lift weights once or twice a week. I focus on the deadlift and the squat. I think those are essential. They are good for improving running economy. Uh, stiffening your tendons uh, and just strengthening your tendons and strengthening your muscles without putting on too much weight. So I lift high weight, low reps. Um, yeah. Next question, Mark Walsh. Is there such a thing as junk miles? I've read about runs that are either easy or intervals, but also they mention junk miles. Is this actually tr a training term or are all miles good miles or wasted or junk miles is irrelevant? Uh, great question, and it's not a it's not a an actual training term. It's something that people throw around a lot. Uh, the idea of junk miles, and of course, at a certain point, it does make sense that you know if you're running all your miles really easy, like super, like suppose you walked all your miles, that wouldn't be specific enough to your running. But it depends the level you're at, right? So relative to your level. Like at a very high level, I think junk miles might be a thing if we're talking really slow miles. But if we're at a lower level, I think junk miles are not as much of an issue because they are closer to our actual easy pace and, and our, even our race pace at that point. Um, that being said, easy miles do build capillaries and they build... As long as you're like around 60% perhaps of maximum heart rate, you are building capillaries, you are improving, building mitochondria, you are improving your heart efficiency, you are working all these things at a very low cost because it's easy, right? You recover easily from it. So I think as a base, you should do a lot of easy mileage. Not like absolutely ridiculously easy, but comfortable. Easy and comfortable. That's a good thing to aim for. And those are certainly not junk miles. And when you're running really slow, like zone one, 
you're really working on recovering from your last day and it's not so much about training so those are not junk miles either uh, generally mileage is king and the more miles the better at a up to point I think at least in the beginning and so I don't subscribe to the idea of junk miles uh, unless they're like ridiculously slow uh, compared to your race pace Diana how should I train to get my feet higher off the ground on my runs so I don't fall? I've experienced a couple of falls in the past two months. The first result in a knee injury, hip pain. Uh, on Global Running Day, I did win a race in my age group. Congratulations. After struggling with injuries and training, but I need to improve my performance, lift my feet higher. Sounds simple, but not for me. Uh, all right. That's an interesting question I haven't thought too much about. Um, you know, the main thing with running form, because that's really what you're asking about, running form, is repetition. So the more repetitions you do of something, the better you get at it typically. It makes sense. So I would just focus on running more mileage, like running more often, running for a little longer, building up your total training volume and trusting the process because over time your body will naturally find the optimal stride. That being said, you know, you don't want to lift your feet too high off the ground because that's a waste of energy. If you're talking running as efficiently as possible, we want to lift, we want to move as little as possible up and as much as possible uh, going forward. So we don't want to really lift our feet too high. We want to lift our feet as little as possible, actually. But of course, if it's to the point where you're stumbling and falling, that's a problem. Um, you could work on drills like, um, you know, running form drills, high knees, butt kicks, uh, and other things just to sort of improve your neuromuscular efficiency in the legs. You could work on proprioception, where you're working on balance, one leg balance in the gym, exercises like that. You should also probably incorporate some strength training to really uh, connect your brain and nervous system to the muscles in a more efficient way. I, I think it's just a matter of doing the training, doing the strength training, working on the proprioception and running a lot. The more you run, the better. And over time, I think it'll, it'll just get better. Alternatively, you can contact me through our Facebook page uh, at The Lone Trail uh, if you want some more advice. Next question, STDRMGTOW. How old are you? And if you're and if you just got seriously into running in your 20s, is it still possible to catch up and peak in your early to mid 30s in half marathons, marathons and trail runs? Good question. I'm 33 and uh, I got seriously into running in my 30s. Like I actually just been training um, consistently for two years. So I'm pretty new at this. Um, I think it's possible for me to you know, it does take a while, like, you know, 10 years or something to really build a large aerobic base from where you can start training really, really well and performing really well. And by that time, I'm in my 40s. And that's a little bit old to, to be at like peak elite level, possibly. But who knows what's possible? I don't know. I'm, I, I like to dream big. I have big dreams, even though it's not crucial for me to reach my biggest goals for me to be happy, but I do like to be ambitious. So I would like to get up to a peak uh, elite level by 40. Um, let's see what happens when I'm like 36, 37, you know, in a few years. It'll be interesting to see. And certainly the longer races like marathons and trail ultras, etc., those are probably more likely to be possible to win even in my 40s. Next question from Jan Folkerervik. Love my ASICS running shoes, but the inner sole started to stink, which has was a new experience with shoes. Threw them out and bought gel inner soles. Terrible feeling. Definitely needed a more solid inner sole. Any recommendation? Yeah, uh, I haven't tried those gel uh, inner soles, but I, I agree that they, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, wobbly and, and just, yeah, terrible feeling, as you say. Um, I would rely on the normal sole that's in the shoe already and if it started to stink I would probably just you know buy I don't know buy buy some cheap maybe you can buy soles that are just basic flat as similar to the ones that are in there as from before or alternatively you could wash them you could always do that and get them de-stinked <laughs> 
Um, or perhaps they're getting old. I don't know how old those shoes are. Uh, if they're pretty old, if like depending on how many mm, kilometers you run in them, perhaps you know once they get to about five, six, seven hundred kilometers, certainly by a thousand kilometers, it's a good idea to change the shoes and buy new ones just to avoid injuries. So um, yeah, I would guess I just recommend washing them, getting a new sole that's as similar to the old one as possible, or buying new shoes. XX, you're unafraid to be afraid. So before a long run, if you hadn't have a, had a bowel movement or if your stomach is off in any way, do you still go for the run? To be perfectly honest, my, my stomach is never off. I, I, I just, I never have a stomach problem anymore with my diet nowadays. Like there's just never a problem. So I never, I have never experienced that. Um, it doesn't bother me too much if I didn't have a bowel movement in the morning, I can still go for a run and have a bowel movement later. No problem. Um, if I had a problem, would I still go for a run? Probably. I would just probably bring toilet paper. I do bring toilet paper, actually. It's just just to make sure in case, you know, in case there's an accident, or not an accident, but in case I have to take a shit on the long run. Yeah, it's good to have the toilet paper with you. Next question from Daniel. What do you think is the best time of day to do a long run? Is it better to wait until the later in the day or would you re recommend doing it after your first meal in the morning? I think this is really a matter of preference. Um, generally though, earlier is better than later. When I say later, I mean I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't save it for the late afternoon, certainly not. But I like to do them around midday, like 11 or 12 o'clock. And you know, for a couple of hours or whatever, um, could I go out early, like you know, before breakfast? Yeah, I probably wouldn't do it before breakfast unless you want to practice running without breakfast. Um, I think, yeah, probably have a breakfast, a small one, and then like an hour later head out, or have a slightly larger break breakfast and head out after a couple of hours. That would be my ideal uh, recommendation. Um, you have more energy earlier in the day, so you don't want to waste your energy on just doing random things and then go for a long run later. Better to make a pri um, priority out of that run and, and go out fairly early. But as I said, I do like to have breakfast and not go uh, too early on my important workouts. Next question is from Faxe Runner. How do you balance training and social media stuff? Filming and taking pictures while training is stressful and can kind of ruin a good smooth flowing day on the trail. How do you do it? Exactly. I, that's exactly my feeling as well. I, I, it is difficult. It's difficult to balance those two things. Um, I sort of make, I decide before I go for a run what type of run it is. So most of my running is I'm focusing, I'm focusing on my running. I'm focusing on my own training. Certainly if I'm doing an important workout, most of the time I will not film or take any pictures. When I film or take pictures, I decide beforehand that this run is, I'm gonna film. I'm gonna do some filming on this run or th during this run I'll take some pictures or every now and then I might come across something that like I just have to take a picture of it and I'll do that. And that's fine if I'm running easy or if I'm running on a long run or whatever. Uh, if I'm in a workout though, I'm focused and I definitely do not um, mess about with uh, with photographing or taking video. Um, yeah, it kind of does ruin the flow, you know, when you're picking out the camera all the time. But it's just like a compromise that you have to do if you want to share your, you know, your training and your life and share what you're seeing on social media. So I think it's there's a compromise there and uh, it's a sacrifice but I like it. It's worth it for me on some runs during the week. And when I do important runs, I, I, you know, I make a point to just not pick out the camera at all, regardless, because I'm in the zone, right? So good question. I think you probably have a YouTube. Yeah, you have a YouTube channel as well. I think I've seen a couple of your videos. Um, checking it out now. Yeah, cool. So you know what I'm talking about. All right. Next question. Frank Borek. Boris say, you have nice hair, how long not cut? You never go to hair cutter or, uh, thank you for that. Um, I cut my hair about 
once every three months or so nowadays. So yeah, my mom does it. No big deal. Uh, I, I used to have long hair and not cut it. I didn't cut my hair for 10 years at one point. I had dreadlocks and yeah, but uh, now I cut it every three months. Next question, Montalban Jr. Have you ever considered running sandals like Luna? And if not, why? I definitely have. I, I For a while there, I was really into them. I, I really wanted a pair of Luna sandals because uh, I have really wide feet and running a lot of running shoes, they don't fit my feet. So I was thinking, yeah, that would be cool. But, you know, on the other hand, in Norway, it's cold and wet and muddy all the time. I was sort of imagining that it would be problematic, even though even though I can run with socks, I know. Uh, it's still... I wasn't really that attracted to it in that sense. But yeah, I, I still would love to try Luna sandals for sure. Um, yeah, I'm gonna try them one day. Uh, maybe you can let me know in the comments what you think. Are they, are they worth it? Why do you like them if you like them? Um, that sort of thing, so yeah. But, but in the grand scheme of things, I think I still would prefer shoes. Just I just like the idea of having my feet. I like the feeling of having my feet uh, inside a shoe rather than exposed. Next question, Riz. Hello, would be cool to see what you do for sun protection on daily runs. Couldn't find the right video you made before. Yeah, um, I build up a tan. That's sun protection basically, constantly monitoring my tan level and making sure I don't get burned. You never want to get burned. And as long as I have a tan that can handle it, I'm cool. Um, depending on the day or how long I'm going to run for, I might decide to, you know, wear clothing. Even if it's a little warm and I want to run with no shirt, I might wear a t-shirt just because sun protection. Clothing is sun protection. I wear a cap. Um, I... Um, might even consider wearing a long sleeve if it's really sunny. Or as I did last summer, I experimented a fair bit with just sunscreen. I would like to find a cleaner, healthier sunscreen, uh, but it requires a lot of research. And I have to, I, I, so last summer I just used a normal sunscreen basically. Uh, I think using sunscreen is better than not using sunscreen and getting burned. But avoiding getting burned without using sunscreen is better than using sunscreen. So. Yeah, but uh, definitely don't get burned. You never want to get burned. Another question from STDR and Migtov. Hey, Lone Trail, another one. Can you recommend the, a Thera gun or another maybe cheaper muscle massage pistol? They seem to good recovery tool, and I think by buying one. Well, I'm, I'm just going to keep it at one question for each person, but I, you know, I can say that I don't know about that product. I don't know anything about it, so I wouldn't be able to answer your question anyway. Uh, I think massage tools can be good, uh, but it probably depends on the uh, pro exact product. Uh, another question from Frank Borose as well. It's hard to find a good shoe for running, um, more bare, but I'm not so into run. I need shoes which are not high protecting. I understand, by the way, I'm new in your channel and find that good work from you. Okay, I think you're saying that you like my channel. Thank you for that. Uh, and you, sh you like shoes that are not protective, I guess you can check out the Luna Sandals. <laughs> Probably check out the Luna Sandals uh, in that case. Andreas Störkesson. Will you ever try the Nike Vaporfly or the Nike Zoom Fly for races? I definitely want to try the, the, the Vaporfly. I mean, it seems that it improves performance, right? And I'm interested in performance. Everyone's using it. So... No doubt I would love to do that. However, I read about them and they are pretty narrow shoes. And the thing is for me that even shoes that are wide are still too narrow for me, okay? When I buy Hoka shoes, I buy the wide model. They have like a few of the models like Clifton, Bondi, and a couple of other ones. That There exists a wide version and I buy that one. And that's still a tad too narrow for me, but it just works. Uh, ho uh, Ultra shoes have a wide toe box, but they're not always as wide as they should, for me anyway, around the midfoot. So even they are too narrow for me and it creates pain in my foot. So 
I don't think I would be able to run with the vapor flies. They would simply be too narrow and my feet would be outside of the sole and I would just be compressed and I don't know. But that being said, I, if I go to a shop and I see them, I'm going to still ask to try them because I would love to try them. Maybe there's some of the other, maybe you know, are there any of the other Nike shoes that are similar to the Vaporfly that are wider? Um, let me know. Two questions left. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll ask, uh, Riz has another question. We'll do that quickly first. Hey bro, do you ever listen to, and I mean really listen to Bob Marley while you're running and realize life is just great? Oh yeah, definitely. Well, not actually. I, well, I listen to Bob Marley and realize life is great a lot. I love Bob Marley. I'm a huge fan. I listen to all of his music, literally all of his music, even the obscure stuff while smoking a lot of weed back in the day. Um, but that being said, I don't actually like listening to music when I'm running. I might listen to podcasts, you know, on 30% of my runs, but um, I just don't like music when I'm running. Even Bob Marley, it would, I, I don't know. I just don't like it. But I'm sure it could be cool to try. Last question. Jen loves this stuff. Asks, Mikhail, I would love to know your thoughts on critical velocity training. Also, what training watch do you use? I used the Garmin Forerunner 630. I made a review of it recently. You can check that out somewhere on my channel. In terms of critical velocity, um, I have to be honest with you that that's something that I haven't spent a lot of time learning about. However, I am aware that it's, you know, it's essentially somewhere slightly harder than threshold, lactate threshold, yet not as hard as a VO2 max um, effort. So putting it somewhere around maybe 90% of VO2 max, you know, 94% of max heart rate perhaps, that would put it at like 10K pace type effort perhaps, depends on the runner and how fast you are. And I think there's definitely room for that. Mosquito. <sighs> Yeah, that the mosquitoes, they, I hate them because they make me itch, obviously, but also they keep me awake at night, so I, I just have to kill them, sorry. Um, yeah, threshold is a really good uh, intensity to stay at. Like, when you're working at your lactate threshold, that's a, that's a very good way of improving your running performance. Uh, the Kenyans, etc., they do a lot of training around this threshold-type effort. Now, in the other end of the spectrum, you have your VO2 max effort, which is really an almost all out, right? Like a really hard effort that you could only sustain for 8 to 12 minutes in a race, right? So that's really hard. That's like 1K repeats in, you know, two, uh, 800 meter repeats and that sort of thing. Right in the middle there, you got somewhere like or in the middle, you have critical velocity, which essentially then would mean that you're working with more lactate than would develop in a lactate threshold run because you're above the threshold, right? So lactate is accumulating throughout your session. Uh, yet you're not working quite as hard, developing quite as much lactic acid as you would if you ran VO2 max intervals. So here's what I think. Alternating, not only alternating within a training cycle, right, like doing a threshold session this week and next week you're doing a critical velocity session perhaps and then the week after you might do a VO2 max session or having periodization where you have like a, a block like a month of like focusing on VO2 max followed by a month of focusing on threshold or something like that but then even in a single session the idea of going above threshold for one rep say you know five minutes above threshold perhaps around critical velocity, and then back down slightly under threshold for another five minutes, and then back up again and alternating back and forth between above and below threshold. That seems to be something that a lot of coaches um, talk about. Fitzinger talks about this. Uh, Renato Canova does a lot of this. We're talking about essentially building up a fair amount of lactate and then by going above lactate threshold and then going below it slightly to allow your body now to start clearing it at a faster rate. And so the idea is that if you have more lactate in the system uh, and then you ease up in intensity a little bit, 
you're now able to sort of improve your ability to clear and buffer lactate, which is a really important thing. So I guess that would be one way to use the critical velocity training. But as I said, I don't know that much about it. I think in general, it doesn't necessarily matter as much. You could stay at threshold and you would still get a lot of the same benefits of critical velocity. Um, it's just a slightly uh, harder sort of stimulus. But then again, you, you would have to then reduce the volume of that training session uh, in order to accommodate that harder intensity. And I think there's a time and a place for that. Other times, though, it might be better to just focus on a, on a solid tempo run around threshold pace and get some a little bit more volume of that quite high intensity. And you'll still be, you know, uh, using type two muscle fibers in all of these three intensities, threshold, critical velocity and VO2 max, um, to the degree, of course, that VO2 max, you would recruit more of the type two B fibers and at threshold there's more of the type 2a fibers and critical velocity probably somewhere in between there so anyway that's a really good question if you have some thoughts about it jen post them down below so i think that's all the questions for now yeah that's all the questions really great questions i appreciate them i appreciate your uh, viewership your subscription uh, if you haven't subscribed, of course, of course, please do subscribe. I, I make videos about running, as you obviously understand by now. And, and remember, if you're interested in monthly Q and A videos, you you should check out my my Patreon. Again, I'll put a link to it there. There's also links in the description where I post Q and A videos every month, and also other exclusive content that you won't find anywhere else online. All right, that was a lot of questions and a lot of talking and, uh, and a pretty long video, but uh, we got through it and I'm going to head out now for an 18k medium long run um, and it's a beautiful day and I, I'm excited. All right, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day. See you around.